Sounds good. Today it's my pleasure to chat with uh, uh, James Blair. He's currently at the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Center, uh, Medical Health Services in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, he's was a long time in the National Institute of Mental Health. He's an expert on psychopathy, antisocial behavior, and um, morality, actually, and, and the neurobiology of that. Uh, his work is in humans, because it's actually hard to model these things in animals, it turns out. And why don't you start, James, by talking about, so you grew up in England, and you went to U University of College London. So you want to talk about like your early interests? Yeah, so I, um, yeah, I, I was uh, brought up in England. I went to, as an undergraduate to University College London. I was then actually one of those confused people at the end of my undergraduate degree of not really sure what on earth I should be doing. And I'd been taught about particularly the theories of morality of uh, Piaget and then Kohlberg as the sort of dominant view then, which, um, which was a sort of view of morality where you developed morality through the rational thought. You basically reasoned your way to a sophisticated morality. And I, as a young bloke, um, thought this was just such an dreadfully wrong that um uh, i must be able to do better than that and um and that was why i ended up uh um uh in the phd program um uh, it could have gone and almost did go horribly wrong because the first year i was i was looking in terms of connectionist uh you know pdp type modeling from um um at that stage and some other sort of um um uh computer-based modeling complete disaster. I was making no progress whatsoever uh, at all. Um, and then I belonged to the MRC, the Medical Research Council Cognitive Development Unit, and they'd done so that seminal work um, looking at theory of mind, the ability to represent the mental states of others, mm -hmm. and showing the problems in theory of mind in patients with autism and then also thinking that if you you know understood that condition or understood that problem you could look at the developmental um uh corollaries of a impairment in theory of mind by working with patients with autism and so fortunately not too deep into my PhD about the end of my first year which had really been a disaster of first year I started thinking that in fact actually if morality really did exist then um, there had to be um, uh, a and you know could, there had to be some biological precursors. And if there were biological precursors to the development of morality, there's very probably a population that were having some difficulty with those biological precursors. Um, and then actually there were two two things that were core at that stage for um one was that um again the dominant view at that time for empathy because obviously empathy seems to be an important seemed to be an important thing was that empathy was theory of mind based that you represented the mental states and then you generated the emotional response and i was watching a movie the uh, dutch version of the vanishing which at one point has the um uh the the bad guy putting chloroform over uh, chloroform clo off over the woman's um, mouth and nose and you get a strong image of her um, um, uh, a really terrified expression um, and this generated this enormous emotional response I, I read online that apparently he hadn't really warned her what he was about to do and actually it was a very genuine it was rather one of those sort of you know dodgy oh. me too moments but um but from my point of view it worked out really well because i had this massive emotional response i realized that there was no way i was representing what she was thinking or anything like this i was reacting extremely strongly just to those basic cues and then i've been doing you know reading about some of the ethologist work of lorenz and the the um, submission cues and I suddenly you know started thinking that perhaps actually that's what we were looking at here is a strong cue that's basically 
communicating submission and do not continue this harmful activity any longer. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and it was highly aversive what I was seeing, you know, this 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 woman's reaction. And then again, uh, and then later, a short time later, um, so I had the beginnings of an idea of what I thought was going to be the precursor. And then I was, but I still hadn't really thought through what would be the condition that would be associated with that problem. And it was a party and somebody just mentioned, um, you know, I don't know why that it came up in conversation, individuals with psychopathy, but it did. But I remember at the party thinking, of course, that is the population I need to work with. That's obviously the population that yeah. um, if there is a population that has problems in this regard, that must be the population. And um, and then I spent the second year of my PhD struggling desperately to get into, into prisons to do the work. And the mm. third frantic year of my PhD, then doing the original studies that then, you know, was a cornerstone for at least my career. So so uh, yeah. so that's that's my history. <laughs> and yeah, so you you start to look at this kind of from an evolutionary perspective, which you know always always makes sense when we're studying anything and it's certainly an, an ev- evolutionary perspective for the development of the basic mechanism. It's not an evolutionary perspective for psychopathy per se, but it's certainly no, an no. evolution. Yeah. So. No, but you know, so some animals are, you know, fairly they're loners. You know, they don't live in groups, and their aggression and kind of antisocial behaviors is an advantage, probably. But but when animals you know, species that start living in groups, then there's got to be some some way of, of uh, working together or, you know, living together. I think the really critical thing is, because obviously, you know, a lot of animal species, you will, in, even in ones that live together, you'll use aggression to, say, establish dominance or right. to, a, to acquire resources. But a really critical thing is that if you've got what you want, you need a cue from the one that you've got it from, who's saying, look, I'm not going to fight anymore. Right. And that you then don't, you, that, that then stops yeah. your aggression, because otherwise there's a danger that they might actually hurt you as you continue to attack. Right. And so I think that's why the submission cues are so important um, in, um, you know, regular, because yeah. the fact is, is that, you know, you know, you know, even chimpanzees engage in quite a lot of aggression. Certainly, dogs engage in quite a lot of inter, inter, in, you know. But again, there's a very clear cue, and rats as well. They have a very cue, yep. you know, clear submission cue to stop yeah. um, um, conspecifics from continuing the attack if the one of them has already, you know, there's no point because they've got effectively what they want. So there's, you know, there's a lot of movies with you know psychopaths, right? And what what is the so you know this psychopathy is a it's in the diagnostic and statistical manual it's a psychiatric problem and how is it how is it diagnosed so actually psychopathy isn't in the DSM oh it isn't um, no the what's in the DSM is um, antisocial personality disorder ah. and antisocial personality disorder is a pretty broad brush concept where based around engaging in antisocial behavior um, and in fact there's lots of criticisms of the of the the, the diagnosis because it's almost sort of um, medicalizing criminal activity um, um, ah. because you can actually you know at least in the DSM um, four you had extremely high proportions of people in jail meeting criteria for ASPD which you know gave rise to a number of concerns um uh psychopathy is um only a subset of individuals who meet criteria for ASPD also meet um category the category of 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 showing psychopathy so to show psychopathy you not only have to show high levels of antisocial behavior but you've in addition got to show these clear emotional difficulties so evidence of a lack of empathy so you know most a lot of people you know having engaged in that particularly an extreme violent act a lot of people um are feeling quite remorse you can actually find people not uncommonly who were suffering ptsd from the act that got them into jail mm-hmm. because the you know it was it's so upsetting when they've you know sobered up or when they're thinking about it later um the the individual um with psychopathy is is remarkable that in the absence of that um um type of um um emotional display so they don't 
don't feel the empathy, they don't feel guilt, they, there's much less likely to be indications of significant attachment to partners or to parents or to even to children. All the, all the strong bonds that, that healthy individuals enjoy are things that these individuals um, don't have the advantage of enjoying. So I looked, you know, in preparing for this, I mainly looked at two review articles. One was the 2021 Nature Disease Primers with Stephane de Brito, uh, Essie Viding, and you and others. And so one of the figures in there, and I've got it in front of me on my other screen, you know, lists kind of the defining features of psychopathy. So they have like an inter interpersonal aspect, affective aspect, or emotional aspect, then lifestyle, and then an antisocial aspect. And um, yeah, so it's yeah, I, I tend to collapse the the interpersonal and the affective together, and the oh. um, um, and the lifestyle and the antisocial aspects together. But you know, factor there are factor analytic solutions that suggest four. I, I just find it easier um, to to because there are other factor two 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 factor solutions, and 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 conceptually, uh, I I'm not convinced. By that there is a clear indication. In fact, I, I, yes, I don't believe that there is a neurocognitive correlates associated with the emotion that is necessarily independent with the interpersonal, um, and um, and some of the factors that are underpinning the antisocial behaviour, I think, are common to the um, lifestyle issues as well. But um, but that's my own view. I mean, that, that's that's still being worked through. But uh, but that's why I tend to collapse it into two rather than the four. Okay, but, but and, the four is a lot of people use the four, and I'm not hostile to the four. I just I uh, I just um, find the two easier to parse. Okay, and so some of the characteristics are glibness, super, superficial charm, grandiose sense of self worth, pathological lying, yep, manipulative behaviors, and as you're saying, you know, lack of remorse or guilt, which which contrasts to, you know, because. I mean, yeah, obviously this has been portrayed in kind of the movies and I guess novels as um, kind of a common trait of a lot of criminals are, are common, but it's not. It's You're saying it's only a small subset. Oh no, it's definitely it's definitely a subset. I mean, this is not yeah. a um, this is yeah. not a, um, I mean, it's small. So um, the numbers tend to be depending on which, you know, forensic location you are and and all the rest of it and some geographical uh, geographical issues as well but but it's definitely i mean when i was doing my the main work for me with adults was back in the uk and i was working in a in a jail um for lifers which is people who've committed um you know typically murder in the uk um and um and uh there it would have been around uh, at most 30 percent of the individuals um who would have met criteria for 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 um psychopathy so yeah it's definitely not it's definitely not a um um and then in the in the general public if when you just screen people in general for these using these kind of criteria what percentage of people would so if you use the full criteria the, the antisocial lifestyle then it, it's suddenly down to one or two percent um um yeah. it's really it's really Love pretty it. i mean it's pretty rare um there's some you know obviously if you're just looking at the emotional component that may be higher although um uh, and it must be higher um um because um because obviously it's not actually if you have the emotional difficulties you're not automatically going to engage in antisocial behavior there's a lot of you know environmental and other factors that go into play there so it's definitely higher than the one or two percent but um um but the actual proportion is difficult to know okay and males versus females 
there are some data that it's um, less common in females than males. So the data, most of the data indicates that. Although, you know, obviously, if you're doing the full, the full categorical spectrum, a lot of that's based on, certainly in, again, depending on which geographical environment, but in the UK, the violence tends to be more um, uh, fist or knife based. So the, it, it's, you know, you have all sorts of um, size related issues that can be contributed to contributing to male female differences but it, but there's the, the the i think most people would think that it's probably more common in males although everybody was going to get a little bit at least a lot of people are going to get a bit shifty because we do, I, do, I don't think we've got categorical data to show that really what i would like to know is is there a are, are, are there any sex differences in the underlying neurocognitive mechanisms and we just do not have the data for that so approximately 30% of, of people incarcerated for murder would fit this. So in, in the United States, as you know, you lived here a long time, and it seems to be getting worse. There, there's a lot of murders. There's even mass murders, you know, seemingly random, you know. That is to say the person committing the crime doesn't know the people personally that they're killing which, you know, I think most of the murders, like one-on-one, -on -one, seem to be more people who know each other somehow. But that's, there's this that's... other group. Is there any, uh, are these people being evaluated? Are there any studies on mass murder? I, I don't. I, certainly, I've never engaged in anything like that, and I haven't really seen much. I wouldn't necessarily attract that. I mean, the, 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 the mass murder, uh, you know, Again, depending on your definition of the mass, you know what a mass murderer is. Whether it's a multiple hom person who's committed multiple homicides, or somebody who's doing some extremely heinous um, act on one particular day, um, I think you know they've they've. Yeah. It, it seems Absolutely. extremely likely to me that they've got a, a far more complicated psychiatric profile than just um, just psychopathy. Hmm. Um, um, but I haven't got great data on that. And, you know, since these these people seem to be, you know, don't care about others' feelings and, you know, they can be impulsive and aggressive and have no remorse if they do something wrong. Um, so, what was I going to say? Yeah, I was watching, I, I watched Boys Town, the movie. Oh, yes. Uh, with, with Father Flanagan, and I think it was 1917, he started this, uh, you know, uh, essentially a home for boys. And the first five minutes of the movie struck me uh, in relation to what I was thinking about it, is that, you know, he's so he's in town, there's a, some kids causing trouble out on the streets. And then at the time, Father Flanagan was running this kind of place refuge for adults that were having problems and and he realized that it didn't seem like he could help them change their behavior but he realized that or he thought anyway he could change the behaviors of the kids and so I guess this is important with your research because you're focused now pretty much entirely on children and adolescents and yes. co conduct disorder um and so was father flanagan right uh i think it's there's a general <laughs> agreement that obviously the earlier that you can intervene the more likely you are to be successful. I mean, not just for, for these sorts of problems, but you know, for depression, for anxiety, for most psychiatric conditions, if you can intervene early, um, it's you're more likely to be successful than if you intervene late. So in that sense, I think uh, Father Flanagan ha was was correct. Would I say that the you know it's obviously very you know that it's impossible to treat adults? Definitely, I wouldn't say that. But um, but um, but but 
like with all psychiatric conditions, it's easier um, to help um, before some of the pathways become established, before some of the behaviors become routinized, all of that sort of that sort of thing. So um, um, if I was a clinician, I would definitely focus my time with kids. And can you do, describe like this, this an example of someone with a I guess psych, psychopath, if you can remember, psychopathy uh, from when you were working in the prisons. Do you recall any particular? I, I certainly I couldn't talk about any particular individuals, um, uh, but um, but um, um, it's 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 uh, it's notable when you really come into contact with somebody who is high in the, that categorical example uh, in that category how indifferent they can be to the suffering of other and they will choose an action that you would be horrified because immediately you're thinking but that's gonna hurt them really badly and it's not proportional to what you want from them you know they may have irritated you but i'm you know you know maybe a stern word but if you're feeling really angry but um um but not that not that type of extreme you know that's going to cause uh hospitalization or lifetime change on your victim totally disproportional to the uh to the thing when I mean, a healthy individual will you know it's not that healthy individuals won't engage in aggression it's that you you know there's a re, you, you know there's a decision making process you're looking at yeah. costs and benefits and you're deciding whether that's the appropriate yeah. here in that in that in that that group of individuals the cost benefit um, process itself may be somewhat compromised and then on top of that the costs associated with the victims are just not being coded very successfully but yeah i couldn't really give any examples because you know that that would be a bit uh, uh yeah i can't do that but but i can okay. you know to give you a flavor okay so then in in children and adolescents um so are the is what is it is a conduct disorder something in the DSM or not? So yes, yeah, so a conduct disorder is the the child equivalent of a antisocial personality disorder. So you okay. gain the diagnosis of conduct disorder from about the age of ten till, and then you lose it from the age of eighteen because you, if you're still engaging in those things, maybe meeting criteria for ASPD in adulthood. Um, it has the same drawbacks as a diagnosis potentially as ASPD because it's really very focused on antisocial behavior rather than on anything else. The least latest DSM-5 did introduce what's called a low prosocial emotion specifier which is based on the emotional component of um, psychopathy but um, um, how useful that's going to be in clinical practice uh, remains to be seen. And is it a similar percent? Uh, so, what percentage of kids, you know, are dis, you know, have this disruptive, antisocial behavior? So I, I, so I think, well, how many the percentage of uh, adolescents meeting criteria for right. conduct disorder can really be quite high. Um, um, uh, you know, if you look at across the epidemiological studies, it could go anywhere between two, I think I've seen as high as 7% or something. So, so um, but the fact is, is that conduct disorder, again, is based around antisocial behavior. Um, uh, there are economic circumstances where, you know, healthy decision making is going to predispose you to antisocial behavior because your ability to acquire resources in any other way is severely limited and so i think that's yeah. what we're looking at when we see that's the limitation of the diagnosis um is that it's based it's not based around it's yeah it's based around um, um uh, a set of behaviors and this i think we all when we're you know when we're growing up we kind of have that. So it seems like a natural thing, you know, fighting over food, two siblings fighting over food or something, which, but, you know, that's a common thing. And then I guess, you know, you get much worse um, 
antisocial interactions. I think one of the one of the that one of the nicest studies I saw, which was not a study focused on on psychopathy, but um, but uh, I thought really illustrated the sort of manifestation in healthies and where it can would therefore be not going was a they they'd set this study up where there was a sort of draw between the screen and there was a desirable toy in the in the drawer that you could play with but only and you had one child on one side of the screen and one child on the other side of the screen and so only one child could play with the toy and they were very eager to look at um um uh i mean i'm not sure it was even an ethical study but it was a long time ago this study was done they were looking at how these children would interact and the use of anger displays to you know to win fights over this limited resource but one of the things they report in some degree of surprise is the fact that if the losing child started to cry often the winning uh, child yes. would yes. relinquish the toy yeah um and uh, and for me that was it was one of those times when you're looking you know reading the literature to you know base the ideas on and all the rest of it and i read this paper and i thought yes that's exactly what we're talking about and yeah. of course the idea would be if you had these problems then you're not going to do it you're you're going to just keep it to yourself and again yeah siblings fight over stuff but it's very rare there's there's another there was another example that was showing that you know about school schoolyard fights if schoolyard fights i mean everybody's seen a schoolyard fight they you know there's that horrible business where everybody groups around and watches it or nowadays everybody films it um but typically when the victim is um shows distress that's when at least according to the study people seem to step in and stop the fight yeah. um now uh, in with all the some of the youtube videos people seem to forget to, to read that study and operate i saw some horrible video the other day about some poor unfortunate girl being bullied at school but um um, um but it's um it's certainly um the uh the that was what the study was reporting what you'd expect to see Okay. Um, I just realized something. Um, I'm going to stop recording and then uh, I've got to get up another Zoom thing. This one's running out of time. I don't know what happened. All right. So after the intermission, <laughs> uh, James, could you talk about your functional MRI imaging looking at different brain regions activity in in children with conduct disorder or this kind of antisocial behavior and kind of your conclusions as to what regions may be responsible for say the emotional aspect versus the kind of altered cognitive you know the way the child is in you know thinking about and and or not and <laughs> interpreting that others emotions so certainly so i mean the 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 first thing we really targeted is to try and identify which neural systems were involved in mediating this reaction to distress cues the sad face of other individuals um particularly but but it turned out that the fear the fearful faces recruit basically the same system and possibly some things related to pain is somewhat overlapping but but certainly fear and sad faces and in fact we've mostly concentrated on fear faces because the signal is easier to obtain with fear faces most of the time and so we did that with with healthy individuals, but um, um, uh, and you see, uh, it's a very clear, relatively well. No, it's a very clear circuit um, that is involved, um, or multi, you know, um, the play of systems from visual cortex and temporal cortex. If it's an emotional stimulus, it activates the amygdala, and you'll get some degree of feed forward into ventral medial prefrontal cortex um, of emotional uh, information as well. Um, uh, and what uh, um, we showed way back in 2008, and it's been pretty well replicated, certainly on the scheme of everybody worrying about fMRI replicability, this has been a pretty robust result. Um, um, it's been shown that um, uh, patients with conduct disorder um, 
potentially generally and certainly um uh, and again it, it's the, there's some degree of inconsistency about how how strong the correlation is with what's termed callous on emotional traits which is the emotional component of psychopathy but there clearly is and are a number of children with conduct disorder who show a profoundly compromised response in um uh the amygdala and because the amygdala is so interconnected with um uh temporal cortex and ventral media you often see certainly problems in te te the temporal cortex signal, sometimes problems in ventral medial, sometimes problems in anterior insula as well. All the sort of uh, regions that are interconnected together to generate this basic emotional signal um, um, are frequently found to be disrupted. So, um, 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 so yeah, so that's that seems to be one of the very clear neurocognitive systems that is disrupted or neuroaffective systems that disrupted in many kids with conduct disorder. And is that similar to what's seen in an adult with psychopathy? You certainly, there are reports of similar things with, uh, with adults. The literature is somewhat more complicated and there's been less focus on distress cues in the adult literature um, uh, than there has been in the child literature. There's quite a large number of studies in the child literature. There's much, much fewer studies um, in the adults and, yeah. more, and more inconsistent data. But the, the child work has, has been, you know, pretty, pretty well replicated. And what's the... What's going on in terms of genes and environment? You know, are there is there any you know gene polymorphisms that might affect one's risk? There are people have made various speculations with respect to that. I don't think there's anything, at least that I'm aware of, that anybody would regard as definitive with respect to polymorphisms or genes. And you know, people occasionally start talking about oxytocin genes, a few other bits and bobs pop up here and there, but nothing that anybody is, at least in, uh, to my measure, is hanging their hat on as these are the real core genes. Um, uh, there clearly is a genetic component. I mean, that I don't think is is very much debated. So there's been several reviews um, and um, several large studies, um, uh, um, both in the States and the UK, showing um, significant heritability of this problem in uh, with callous on emotional traits, or even looking directly at the responsiveness um, um, uh, uh, to emotional st st signals, seeing again a reasonable be good heritability so there is a genetic component what exactly that genetic component looks like that is a little bit more uh, unknown and it may be you know like with the many of these things that it is the contribution of so many that it's going to be very difficult to disentangle but um but at the moment uh, but the, there's clearly something there given the heritability isn't one there's obviously environmental components in there as well um they you know sometimes people talk in terms of trauma and abuse as potential exacerbators of the issue the complication there is that for most individuals particularly abuse is associated with heightened emotional responsiveness rather than decreased emotional responsiveness um but that's not to say that it couldn't interact in certain genetic um um profiles in a in a in an exacerbator of the reduced rather than an exaggerator of the uh, of the of the healthy but um but um um so but the, the clearly are environmental contributions it, the, it's 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 not clear exactly how they're operating I, I saw one paper that suggested that there's a an association with increased i guess conduct disorder callous emotional traits in children who are relatively neglected when they're really young uh, there, there's certainly, I mean, again, there, and certainly, at least from our data, we've seen um, neglect does seem to be associated more with uh, diminution in responding rather than exaggerating re with responding like with abuse. But having said that, 
the data that we've seen it, you know, we've seen an impact on neglect in systems involved in reinforcement based decision making, rather than the systems involved in responding to distress cues. So, um, so it could be, I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to discount it, but but it's not within my own data, you only ever really believe your own data until you find out there's enough people replicating somebody else's data and your data is wrong, but you, you tend to believe your own data. Um, and on the base of that, I am pretty confident that neglect is having an impact on systems relative to conduct disorder. I'm just not confident it's having an impact with respect to responsiveness to distress cues and responding to emotional stimuli more generally. And so one would expect you know, if, if these kids are, you know, adults with psychopathy aren't responding to, you know, a, a fear, you know, seeing someone else in a, someone else's fear, um, then what about the autonomic nervous system? Is there, do they not have an increase in heart rate and blood pressure when they... Uh, the, it's more tricky to do it with um, with heart rate, but there's been a number of studies looking at skin conductance response, which is an easy measure of emotional um, reactivity, and that's been a very consistent. I mean, I did a couple, and there have been a couple showing the same effects with um, with other groups um, prior to my studies, and that's with adults and with kids. Uh, and then there's been subsequent work. It's it's it's. I, I, I mean, I'm sure there are some non-replications out there, but I, it's again a pretty robust finding yeah. that adults with psychopathy or kids with callous unemotional traits show problems in autonomic responses to emotional stimuli, particularly distress cue stimuli. Yeah, reduced responses. Reduced responses. Yeah. 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 So that that kind of makes sense. <laughs> in, in, in light of it, and so they, um, so the so kids with conduct disorder, what what problems do they have in their own lives and and others' lives as they grow up? So, so it looks. To, I mean, when I'm thinking about the sort of profile of patients with with conduct disorder, I think that the problems in distress cues is only one of the functional difficulties that they're faced with. Um, uh, conduct disorder is extremely comorbid with ADHD. So 70% um, mm -hmm. roughly of patients with conduct disorder will also oh. meet criteria for ADHD. And if you look at the sort of classic functional difficulties that patients with ADHD face in this, you know, response inhibition, there's a uh, circuit in dorsal medial, anterior insulin, inferior frontal striatum that allows you to engage and, you know, to inhibit dominant responses. That's very compromised. There's a lot of data showing that's compromised in ADHD. I, uh, we've seen it also in patients with conduct disorder. Other people have seen it with conduct disorder. So that's another problem I think many patients with conduct disorder face and maybe underpinning this very high comorbidity with ADHD. A third problem is um, um, issues with respect to reinforcement-based decision-making. So the, the response to reward and the recruitment you know, within striatum and associated systems appears to be compromised in many patients with, uh, with conduct disorder. And again, is also found in the, that highly comorbid condition, ADHD, and may even perhaps be more driving the um, impulsivity uh, and the ADHD behaviors than the conduct problems although my guess would be it contributes to the conduct problems because if you're making poorer decisions on the basis of reward and punishment some of those poor decisions are going to be antisocial based but um, um but uh, but there's those at least those three functional difficulties that these kids face and then there's obviously this you know at the very at the very very most salient it's a highly SES de dependent diagnosis you're much more likely to receive this diagnosis if you're coming from an impoverished environment than a, 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 a well-resourced environment and I think most of that really is is that you know if you're a well-resourced in a well-resourced environment your ability to get what you want is not deter is not you know it's very unlikely that you're mm. ever going to have to implement mm. antisocial behaviors to achieve what you want whereas or at least it's significantly less likely whereas if you're in a system if you're in 
in, in circumstances where you're you're you know it's much more difficult to achieve your goals because you know mm -hmm. there isn't a job there isn't a way of doing um you know a paper round or whatever other things that people do in order to you know get more or the parents just can't supply um them automatically then then um um the there is going to you know you're going to be looking around for alternative ways of achieving your goals and um a healthy individual in those circumstances might still shy away and certainly shy away from extremely antisocial ways of achieving those goals whereas um uh, an individual with some of these types of problems is going to be more likely to uh you know be able to select those behaviors and implement. Uh, that that's very interesting so that suggests that and you kind of mentioned this before that the home environment as far as you know the 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 parents behaviors and so on may not necessarily predict um whether or not a child will have conduct disorder but it could be that this you know they just don't have the opportunities and to I think I mean there are there are definitely parental there are there's there's family home variables that increase the risk for receiving yeah. the diagnosis. It just like they they so they they, they you know the um there's inconsistent parenting um, um mm -hmm. use of punishment and the parenting strategy. Yeah. Those things increase the risk for mm -hmm. antisocial behaviour, um and probably for the diagnosis of conduct problems. Um I don't. I don't think of those as necessarily giving rise to the neurocognitive difficulties nice. associated with, uh, with at least with the um, with callous and emotional traits. So that mm. emotional problem, although again, some of those things are highly correlated with a neglecting, um, uh, at least emotionally neglecting environment. So. Um, um, you know, the, the, you, you're getting uh, you. You there's there's certainly environmental components that we know will be hitting some of the systems that we know are not working necessarily very well in um, at least some patients with conduct disorder. So you mentioned a, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder (ADHD), and you know when I was growing up, you know our age. So I was in high school in the early 70s, middle school, late 60s. And there, back then, I, I in high school, for example, I never heard the word autism. I never heard ADHD. Um, now, is, is, is some of this appearance is this recognition of the kids that this is really a problem and that uh I think this enorm enormous component of this is is actually yes, indeed, with the, the the there's been this massive increase in sophistication for understanding some of the difficulties that that kids are facing. Um, uh, I'm sure that you know that there are, there is some literature that's suggesting that it may be some degree of incidence increase as well, um, and that might be all sorts of environmental and and reporting related factors contributing to that. But um, but. Uh, was the you know depending on how big your high school was was there individuals there who would be quite able to meet any of these diagnostic Probably, labels yeah. i'm sure there were yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean I, I certainly when i look back at my school i could think of at least one individual um yeah. that uh showed all the classic difficulties yeah. that i would associate with conduct disorder and 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 um um callous on emotional traits and um um yeah i mean i really wouldn't have been thinking in terms of adhd and, and i and i you know but uh but uh but yeah so they, I, they were definitely around i mean they, they, it's the these difficulties are not have not suddenly emerged these difficulties have been the you know the kids have been having to deal with these difficulties for quite some time and, and so the, to try to help these kids that it's behavioral interventions that there there's evidence can help a lot is that true and, and if so what what kind of 
-hmm. So there's some degree, there, there is definite data, very clear data showing that um, there are psychosocial interventions that benefit a large number of conduct, kids with conduct problems. So um, um, there's a program at the Institute of Psychiatry that is in London that's extremely effective at um, helping young kids with conduct problems, uh, reducing their conduct problems um, uh, 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 over time. Um, um, and and um, there are comparable programs in the States and all the rest of it. And Boys Town itself is highly successful um, 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 at, you know, m many of the, uh, the kids at Boys Town have faced very significant difficulties and, and are, you know, both environmental and um, uh, personal. And um, the, the, the numbers of kids who then go on to have, um, or the percentage of kids that go on to have then, you know, productive lives and, you know, um, um, uh, is is very high. So there are a number of psychosocial interventions that definitely reduce. Now, to what extent that works with the child who's having real uh, these emotion level difficulties is much much more strongly debated. There's definitely people out there that think that it that it that 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 that, that the current interventions work well, and they may be right. Certainly, you do see reductions in these types of traits. I mean, I, I saw it in the Boys Town sample. People have reported it in other in other contexts for other psycho, psych, psychosocial. I will say though, in a in a study that recently we published in um, um, with the Institute of Psychiatry group. We were looking at successful successful responders versus less successful responders, and the marked feature of the less successful responders was that they were not showing a strong amygdala response to the distress of other individuals. Mm -hmm. And you can certainly imagine if you're facing a real difficulty with that emotional responding, trying to take advantage of some of these interventions may be difficult. So, um, 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 but. Again, these things are always on dimension. There are, you know, you could probably help quite a large number, of, you know, so I certainly wouldn't want to be discouraging. And quite frankly, this was just one study. And um, there are other studies out there definitely suggesting beneficial impacts. Um, 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 but I, 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 I would be... I, I, I long for a day where we have a targeted intervention that would help that system in particular and then give the child the opportunity to potentially really benefit from the psychosocial intervention. Yeah, that's a pharmacologically, you know, drug development. That's, you know, how do you do it? I mean, so these circuits, they're all mainly glutamatergic, right? This is the, the main excitatory neurotransmitter. So throughout the brain, it's glutamatergic, excitatory neurons, inhibitory GABA, and then you have these other transmitters, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. The only way those, the latter transmitters affect behavior is by modifying the ongoing activity of the glutamatergic circuits. So you can't really develop, I don't see how you can possibly develop a drug that selectively targets... No amygdala neurons and not other neurons um, no that, that i completely agree with you i mean that though um you wouldn't i mean after all the um, methylphenidate is a very effective intervention for kids with adhd um uh and that's going to be having impacts on neurons beyond the um beyond the inferior frontal basal ganglia dorsal medial that that appears to be so central in in for many cases with adhd that, um, that's uh, that's adderall uh, yeah, Adderall. Yes, uh, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's basically the yeah stimulant medications. Um, yeah. Um, 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 and um, um, uh, you know, so so you don't have to be thinking in terms of necessarily targeting amygdala. You just have to be thinking in terms of targeting. Um, uh, you need something that might help. But again, look, we don't have this at the moment. So, um, 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 and we're not at the level of being able to say this child with conduct disorders coming into the clinic, they have problem profile 
you know, they have problems with the reinforcement problems, they have problems with the distress queue, but perhaps they don't have problems with the, re the response inhibition. So we really need to work with these two problems and not really worry about the third problem, at potential problem at all. We, we're not at that sort of level of being able to, yeah. you know, provide individualized care. But if we could provide individualized care, um, then even if the pharmacological interventions and the psychosocial interventions have these broad brush effects, we can index um, whether part of the broad brush effects includes the stuff that we're really trying to help the particular child with. Yeah, so it's really going to take a, a broad, you know, society-wide effort to, you know, need to reduce poverty, right? Childhood poverty is a big factor. Um, you know, educational opportunities. Um, what about exercise? Does... <laughs> You know, exercise seems to be kind of a panacea <laughs> for mental health. So I, I, I mean, I don't think anybody's looked at it with in respect to this, uh, um, uh, this particular. There's no doubt about it. It definitely. There's quite a lot of data suggest that it that it has some degree of beneficial effects for internalizing conditions, and I think potentially for ADHD as well. So. If it's having an effect, uh, if it is really having an effect helping some kids with ADHD, then it probably would help some kids with conduct disorder, at least those individuals who have comorbid ADHD. So mm -hmm. I, and certainly it's clearly a good thing generally for all sorts of reasons to do it, even though as soon as I start doing, I think, oh, I haven't exercised for at least a couple of days, I really better go and do some exercise quick because mm -hmm. I can't really uh, suggest people do it and then not do it myself. But, um, but, um, but uh, but uh, but there's not clear data specifically for for um, callous on emotional traits, for example. But I don't think it would do any harm. Well, I three years ago I had a mountain bike accident and I had three surgeries and I I couldn't exercise for months. And boy, it had a dramatic negative effect on. Yeah, you know, I started to get depressed. I, you know, have some of these traits we're talking about you know um, I, I mean there's no doubt about it it's 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 extremely benefit from beneficial from physical and from mental health yeah it's yeah, it's yeah. a it's a very it's a very it's a very a very important component of a balanced life yeah Has any, and there are no animal models right is, is anyone trying to you know it's so there are, there's not really an animal model as such, but there are people who've done work. In fact, we did it. I mean, I, I didn't do it, but I was in collaborate, collaboration with a group that that uh, that um, um, uh, did it um, at, at Maryland, actually, University of Maryland. It was um, um, one of the, one of the, um, um, yeah, um, that, but, um, and you, you can, because it is, such a basic response the 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 distress cue yeah, yeah. Um, submission cue makes thing it makes the makes the conspecific back off you can at least work through the circuitry um uh with um with um um uh you know animal work because rats rats do it too um yeah. and so um there's been a few people who've looked at things like that um um as i said we did this one study showing that um a rat pressing a bar for food will have a significant diminution of the striatal reward response if that um, bar pressing is paired with the sound of another rat in distress. So um, uh, you can see some of the sort of, you know, knock on yeah. effects. Um, yeah. And other people have done um, um, comparable, but actually, taking that forward and then using it in the way that you know people have animal models of autism or animal models of adhd that hasn't taken place yet yeah, yeah. That's not at all yeah you could imagine doing a lot of experiments just with that paradigm though right doing a lot of manipulations and well a lot of things first you could ask can you kind of do selective breeding for you know, I, like they did with domesticated dogs, right? You, yep. but in, this, in the case of the experiment trying to develop an animal model, you would select for rats with callous, unemotional. Yeah, no, I mean, the and then interbreed those and. You know, 
it, it, there's no doubt about it. There are there are things that could be done. I mean, again, it's not it's outside of my scientific yeah. purview, but um, but no, I I mean, one of the reasons why I was involved in this project was because I think it would be so useful for the field if we had a good animal model because it would allow us to look at you know uh, molecular level. Um, questions which we really can't look at um, uh, or at least it's very very difficult to look at um, uh, in uh, in humans so um, so um, so um, I um, but but you know hopefully there's somebody out there who's thinking you know that is what I should spend my life with and uh, and really get this one through because I mean you know these, these the thing about it is is that the it is not a pleasant condition to have yeah. you are basically you know you you're yeah you're, you're more predisposed to do all these unfortunate things and cause suffering to other individuals but even at your own level you don't you're you're much less likely to experience love and all of those things that you know make life good yeah. so um um so it would be good to benefit um you know to have proper interventions that benefited the people and benefited people around them i did one podcast with larry young who's down at uh, emory on the neurochemicals of love oh, there you go. and so what about oxytocin I mean, people, you know, people talk about it. It does certainly have an impact on expression processing. So it's certainly a possibility. We, we, um, I've, again, with the Institute of Psychiatry, have been involved in a couple of intervention related projects with oxytocin on um, adults with, with psychopathy, um, um, which at least have been provocative. Would I say they were definitive? Absolutely not. But provocative, at least. Um, mm -hmm. um, 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 yeah, without a doubt, provocative. Okay. So, so. All right. So, you know, we covered a lot of ground and um, this is a really interesting area of research, a lot of implications for helping kids and, and, and society and schools, school systems. Uh, in that regard, are, are there, so are there school, uh, systems that get involved in the research i guess there would be or how, how do you identify the kids in terms of you just wait till the parents have them come to see somebody or is there any effort uh, so them? yeah no i i mean i since i moved to this well since i moved to the states i'm not in the states anymore but um i moved, when i moved to the states I, I my most of my recruitment was done in the context of medical settings yeah. when i was back in the and now of course i'm in a psychiatry department here in, in copenhagen when i was in the uk though most of the child work that i was engaged in was in uh was not in a in a in a clinical setting at all but within schools schools um for uh, disruptive kids yeah. so so um, um, uh, you definitely can recruit in school settings at least in uh, you know certainly within these disruptive schools there was there was there was a significant number of children who were having these sorts of problems okay and are school systems though like counselors or, or, or mental health professionals that associated with schools are they um, is, is that I assume that's in place. And are there any specific programs, say, for public schools? So I don't know. Actually, I really don't know. I, I mean, I think that um, the um, the uh, yeah, I really don't know as regards yeah. the um, how to what extent this this sort of these sorts of ideas are. Um, you know, there's definitely lots of concerns within schools with respect to autism, with respect to ADHD. Right. Um, um, uh, conduct problems are, are complicated, and um, and um, and uh, yeah. so um, yeah. um, it's not it's not. I'm sure there are, but I don't know. I, I I didn't work within the school systems in the U, U.S. Um, enough to really give you any useful answer. Yeah, I guess it would be very difficult in the context of kind of a normal class environment. Um, you but know. again, it is pretty, you know, it is, you know, it's, it's relatively rare. So, you yeah. know, probably the, you know, you're talking, you know, if you've got a, a year of 100 kids, you may have two or three in that year, but that's yeah. still uh, a very, 
you know, it's a very small minority. And especially, you know, if you have a spectrum of patients uh, or individual, not patients, but a spectrum of kids who have ADHD related issues, that's going to be a significantly higher yeah. proportion. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, maybe not on autism, but certainly um, um, social cognition related difficulties. Again, you've got a higher proportion um, yeah. of, 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 um, of uh, you know, so if I was putting my, um, uh, you know, my buck in, yeah. I would concentrate on those things probably before I would concentrate on yeah. conduct problems. Yeah. Okay. Okay, James, it's uh, nice to meet you and talk to you, and I hope you have a, a good spring and summer in Denmark. Indeed. Well, I, it was great to speak to you as well. Thanks very much for the invitation. I uh, wish you the best, and, um, and uh, until the next time. See, yeah. you, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.